Welcome to the City Summit of the Americas University Office Hours. My name is Laurel Smalley, and I will be the moderator for our discussion today. I am a master's candidate of Global Economic Affairs at the Corbell School of International Studies, and I've had the pleasure of serving as a project coordinator for community outreach at the City Summit of the Americas. We are excited to have you all here with us today to talk about the importance of young voices in public policy debates. Before we begin our discussion, I want to recognize the presence of Indigenous people on the land the University of Denver and the broader city of Denver are located on. Held in stewardship by the Cheyenne and Arapaho Nations, we additionally recognize the descendant communities of the Northern Cheyenne of Montana, the Northern Arapaho of Wyoming, the Southern Cheyenne and Arapaho of Oklahoma, and the Southern Ute and Mountain Ute Nations here in Colorado. These communities were, remo were removed from their native lands, and we wish to pay respect to their elders, both past and present. Today, we begin the final session of our educational conversation series, City Summit of the Americas University Office Hours. This series has invited representatives from civil society, academia, federal, and local government to discuss the main policy themes of the inaugural City Summit. Previous discussion topics have included Subnational Diplomacy 101, migration, and disinformation and democracy. If you missed them, recordings of all of our previous discussions are now available at citysummitoftheamericas.org. Next week, the U.S. Department of State and the City of Denver, Colorado will host leaders from across the Western Hemisphere at the first City Summit of the Americas, bringing together leaders from government, business, civil society, youth, the arts, and more. The City Summit will promote regional cooperation among cities and states of all sizes on the most important global challenges facing the Americas. Simultaneous to the City Summit, the U.S. Department of State and the City of Denver will host the City Summit of the Americas for Youth. We have Manuel Aragon joining us, the Operations Director of the Biennial of the Americas, to tell us more about the Youth Summit. Manuel? Thank you, Laurel. And, and thank you to our participants for joining us. I know that some of the folks online with us today will be joining us next Thursday and Friday for the City Summits of the Americas Youth Summit, which will take place at the McNichols Building. We are so excited to see you next week and have you join us. We have a, an amazing array of guests, including uh, folks from all across the Western Hemisphere. We will be dialoguing around issues like climate change, social justice movements, entrepreneurship, digital innovation, and uh, community preservation. If you have not registered, we, we just took the link down yesterday, but if you're interested, you're here in Denver, you haven't registered, I'm gonna put my email, I think I can drop that in the chat. Let's see, maybe I don't have that ability, but, we can include that information in the email that we send out to everyone registered. For Perfect. The yeah. So if you'd like to attend, uh, feel free to drop me an email and we can get you registered. So thank you, Laurel, for giving me this chance to spotlight it. And uh, we, we can't wait for the Western Hemisphere to meet our wonderful youth leaders from across the from Denver. So thank you. Thank you, Manuel. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> and today we begin the last conversation of our City Summit Office Hour series entitled Youth Civic Engagement and the City Summit. For the purposes of this conversation, we will be using the Latin American definition of youth, which includes young people between the ages of 18 and 39. That said, I'm excited for the opportunity to introduce all of our panelists for our discussion today. To start, I am joined by Kevin O'Reilly. Mr. O'Reilly is the Summit of the Americas National Coordinator at the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs. Prior to assuming his current role in 2022, Mr. O'Reilly served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Brazil and Southern Cone Affairs and Andean Affairs. Mr. O'Reilly previously served as Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy in Panama City from 2014 to 2017 and as the Embassy's Charge d'Affaires from 2015 to 2016. A career member of the United States Senior Foreign Service, Mr. O'Reilly has held additional positions as Director of the Office of Mexican Affairs, Senior Director for International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, and at the White House as the National Security Council Director for North American Affairs. 
He has also served as Director for Latin American Affairs in the Department of Homeland Security's Office of International Affairs. Thank you for joining us, Mr. O'Reilly. Well, it's a great pleasure. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And Mr. O'Reilly is joined by the Mayor of Denver, Colorado, Michael Hancock. Mayor Hancock is serving his third term as the 45th mayor of the city and county of Denver, Colorado, and is the second African-American to hold the position. He is a member of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, where he chairs the Communications and Transportation Committee, is vice president of the National Conference of Democratic Mayors, and is a member of the African-American Mayors Association. Mayor Hancock began his public service career at the Denver Housing Authority and uh, the National Civic League to become the youngest president of an urban league chapter in the United States. He additionally served for eight years at the Denver City Council, where he served two terms as the city council president. During his tenure, Mayor Hancock has faced and overcome a variety of challenges, ultimately elevating Denver as a thriving city and global leader. Welcome, Mayor Hancock. Thank you, Laurel. Glad to be here. And to complete our panel today, we have Dr. Anne DePrince joining us. Dr. DePrince is the Associate Vice Provost of Public Goods Strategy and Research at the University of Denver. Dr. DePrince works with community partners to identify research questions that can inform policy and practice while advancing our scientific understanding of trauma outcomes and interventions. She works with criminal justice and community-based organizations and agencies such as the Denver Police Department and the Rocky Mountain Victim Law Center to identify factors that predict trauma-related outcomes and test violence interventions. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right, and we will now move to the discussion portion of our time today. And for those of you in the audience, please be sure to submit your questions in the chat or the Q&A function in Zoom. I'll start by inviting our student speakers, Johnny and Annika, to join our discussion and ask the first round of questions. So our first question is from Annika Turnquist. Annika is a master's candidate of public policy at the Corbell School, specializing in social policy with a primary emphasis on education policy. She will graduate in the summer of 2023 and has worked in a variety of policy arenas over the last two years, including at the Colorado State Capitol and at, the national at a national education policy consulting firm. Welcome, Annika. Thank you for having me. Um, so my question definitely comes from my policy background. Um, so my question is, given that so many young people's opinions are sort of automatically dismissed simply because of their age, um, like what kinds of actual programs um, can we implement that would incentivize young people to participate? And what kinds of steps can we take to remove that age bias and create like more authenticity to ensure that we are actually hearing and acting on the concerns of the young people in our community? Is that directed to anyone in particular? <laughs> I think the panel as a whole. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll start. And uh, Your Honor, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. I and I, Annika, thank you for the question. I think it's a good one, uh, but I'm going to not agree with you that the voices are dismissed. I, I think certainly um, I have found in, in Denver that uh, young people's voices are extremely valuable in public policy development because ultimately it impacts them as well, right? And so you got to think about and look at what the um, vehicle is to elevate the voices or create the opportunity for young people to vote or to have their voices heard. One, and there are several in Denver, one is we have a, a youth commission where they are, young people are duly appointed by the mayor to serve in an advisory capacity to work together to bring the mayor and the city and the administration recommendations, suggestions, ideas, and to engage them. I meet with them twice a year. They meet regularly monthly, but I meet with them twice a year where they do um, semi-annual reports uh, you know, the things that they're focused on. Some of the areas that they have been focused on that really made a difference in the city of Denver is uh, behavior health challenges facing young people and how we can meet them where they are and some of the challenges that they're facing. Today, Denver has, um, another example, Denver has uh, a city council where they have regular open forums where people can come and, and address. It doesn't take an invitation or an age limit to come and do that. You can be five, you can be 18 or 39. Um, the reality is that microphone is open to whoever wants to speak and public policy makers, including city council and my administration are listening. I will tell you that uh, a young person who didn't wait for an invitation came to my office about 10 years ago and said, I have an idea 
you know, while we are dealing with truancy issues and teen pregnancy issues and drug issues and dropout rates with young people, you're charging young people to become members of our rec program. And you have 29 rec centers throughout the city of Denver. It could be open and safe haven for young people where they can get tutorial uh, assistance, where they can maybe get a meal before they go home, particularly for those who don't have meals available to them. And she said, you should make them free. And it was her idea that we create this My Denver card. Her voice was heard. And today, instead of 700 Denver kids having access to our rec centers through membership, we have over 100,000 young people who are in the rec centers because My Denver card became available. So I think young people have um, their voices heard in our city. And I know many cities uh, that will be part of the city summit around the Western Hemisphere, they have similar forums for young people to engage. So you have to make sure that the ecosystem, that the framing framework is available that seems to be inviting where young people can invite themselves to engage. Thank you for that great response, Mayor Hancock. Uh, Kevin, I see that you unmiked yourself. <laughs> Would you like to respond? Well, mostly what I was gonna say is uh, offer the floor to, uh, to the professor, but I can jump in as it will. Um, I guess the first thing is people try. We've had with the summit, summits of the Americas process, a whole framework for promoting um, engagement and consultation with youth organizations across the hemisphere. And this is something that um, started uh, before we took up the baton again as host last year in Los Angeles but it's something that the United States government has sponsored for I think something like 15 or 16 years now. I'd actually have to go back and check. But uh, this youth forum that we do with the summits of the Americas drew out of that. And we insisted uh, in our structuring of the events that'll take place in, in uh, Denver next week that the same, uh, the same apply. Um, one of the implicit notes I think that you hit, Your Honor, is uh, knock on the door harder. Um, it takes a little bit of moxie to show up and tell the mayor of Denver, Colorado, how to do their business, right? I mean, I, I certainly wasn't in that meeting, but I, they must have shown up with uh, notes and ideas and, uh, and a, little bit of, uh, a little bit of oomph behind them. Uh, to capture your attention that way. And that's certainly what I have found uh, on lots of issues. Let's be serious for a moment. We all know about the student activism in Florida and across this nation at uh, Marjorie Stoneman Davis High School, right? Um, I don't expect you to go out and uh, win a Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, if you want to, uh, that's grand, but we do know the name of Malali uh, Yousafzai, and I don't expect you to become the poster uh, students of uh, environmental activism, but we all know the name of Greta Thunberg. Um, in that last case in particular, um, she had to bang on the door pretty hard, pretty young, before people paid attention. But then when the pivot point came, she and people around her, and most of them were very young, knew how to capitalize on it. Now, let's be honest, um, those kinds of opportunities, those moments, people on a, on a global scale, people meet rarely, but on a national scale across our hemisphere, in a local scale, uh, they appear much more frequently. And um, I do think, uh, Annika, that you've got a point that some people uh, will have a tendency to say, uh, what do they know? What does she know? Um, but it's not universal and both in structured engagements and otherwise, it has a real influence. There's this terrible incident that happened just a few days ago in Kansas City. Kid knocks on the wrong door and um, 
gets shot for his troubles. Well, his whole school walked out um, in a form of protest, but more directly in a form of support. And they captured the attention of their whole city, of Quentin Lewis, their mayor, of their whole state and the whole nation. And believe me, because I, I, cru I, I cruise through the national press of most of the countries in this hemisphere, at least in a cursory manner, uh, pretty much every morning. It's part of my job. Uh, all over the world, a bunch of high school kids. Uh, you can do it. Sometimes you just have to shout a little louder. I think to build on uh, Mr. O'Reilly's uh, mention of Moxie, one way I would think about Moxie is um, understanding your self-interest. So what is the aspect of an issue where you have a stake, you have a self-interest in it? Um, and how does that connect with your passions? That How does that connect with your understanding and, and uh, academic knowledge of the world for many folks coming out of high school and college uh, and post um, postgraduate sorts of uh, spaces where you're able to bring a really rich understanding to, to issues and connect it with your passions. And I think the more that each of us, regardless of age, can understand our self-interest in the great public problems of our time, there's a new way to invite other people in. And so I think some part of Youth Voice is about knocking on, on doors in the ways that we've been talking about. Another piece that I have uh, had the great privilege to see at, at DU is um, how students have, and, and, and young people more generally, have an essential perspective that we are not going to get to good and sustainable and lasting and transformative solutions without youth perspectives. And so through understanding your self-interest and connecting to inviting other people in to see we have a collective interest in working together, um, I think there's a, an incredible uh, amount of power that youth can bring uh, to problem solving and to collaborations. I recently, um, just yesterday actually, got to hear a group of DU students talk uh, with some decision makers about issues related to eco distress and climate change. And there was a point in their presentation where they were talking about youth perspectives on this issue where the survey after survey shows that youths don't see government as having been responsive fast enough to the impending uh, climate issues and extreme weather and, and, and challenges we're, we're dealing with around the globe. And part of what the students did so effectively um, was they invited us to intergenerational solidarity. They put a word uh, and a way for folks to understand how we should be working across age groups in similar ways that we have I think gotten more practiced and better at thinking about how do we work across different other dimensions uh, of diversity. Um, and so that, that message of um, collaboration that, that you have an essential stake in the future and you have incredibly important personal and professional perspectives to bring to bear, um, I, I would encourage you uh, to, to, to bring all that to bear. And then I would also just mention, I would be remiss to not mention, this is not your problem alone to, to solve. So when youth voices are not, um, are not met with the kind of openness that Mayor Hancock talked about, um, having a network of allies to bring people in who can help you um, prop that door open, I think is essential as well. But youth are not responsible by themselves to, to figure out how to, to sort of um, uh, uh, break down these doors non-violently, of course. Yes, yeah, a great way to explain how to use your passions for change, if you will. All right, thank you so much, Annika, for that great question. And thank you, panelists, for your responses. Our next question is from Johnny Valdez. Johnny is a master's candidate of global economic affairs at the Corbell School, specializing in financial development of indigenous sovereign nations. Johnny serves as a programming assistant at the Native American and Indigenous Initiatives at the University of Denver. Uh, he's also a co-president of the Corbell Graduate Students of Color Group and will graduate in June of 2023. Welcome, Johnny. 
Thank you, Laurel. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm excited to be here in, in, in such great uh, a community with some great people. Um, my question is, it's, it's two-parted. Um, what challenges and barriers do youth from underrepresented groups face when they attempt to get involved in their local governments and policy spaces? And how do they overcome those challenges and barriers to have a voice and make a positive change? I think, uh, Johnny, first of all, congratulations on your graduation and the pending graduation in a couple months. Uh, it's a great feeling, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I think it was a lot of what we just talked about here, and that is overcoming the biases that are inherent in adults that uh, you've got to pay your dues or there's a lot more for you to learn before you engage. I can't tell you personally how many times my children have warned me about something or tried to inform me of something and I dismissed their voice only to have to come back and say, oh my God, you're right. <laughs> and so it's uh, it's the old biblical adage that the children shall lead you. And if you listen, there is some inherent instinctive uh, wisdom that is there for young people, not born by years, but just born by instinct and their perspective uh, on, on life. Um, let me just also remind us that uh, many of the great movements that we have seen on, on, in this country were started by young people and really led by young people. Martin Luther King, was the face of uh, the civil rights movement. But you know, there was these students uh, for nonviolent change. There were students for uh, Southern Christian leadership. There was a schnick that was there. Um, they, they were there. They were, they, they were the ones who sat at the counters. It wasn't Dr. King. Um, they were leading marches. They were the ones who stood up and um, you know, really moved this and, and really challenged. Dr. King and many of his contemporaries talked about how the young people challenged them to push harder and faster and have a sense of urgency. And we see it today. We have seen it today during the George Floyd movement, um, uh, the, the movement that followed the, the murder of George Floyd and many of our other, uh, unfortunately, African-American uh, men and women who have been murdered by uh, law enforcement because of excessive force and terrible mistakes. Many of the young people in this country have moved these conversations along. And, and um, that I think that sense of, uh, of uh, lacking of patience from young people have been an added value in many of these critical issues that we as a nation are facing, housing, economic uh, equity, um, you know, and Black Lives Matter, young people have moved this nation forward. And you, by the way, and I, I don't, can't remember who said this, but I think maybe it was Kevin O'Reilly. It's not just in the United States. And I think that's the power of the summit of the cities. When we sit down with mayors and leading officials from other parts of the hemisphere, we're going to hear many of the same stories. Young people in Venezuela standing up, speaking out, pushing the envelope, saying we deserve the right to have our own, uh, to, to determine our own destination in this economy, in this world. Same thing in, 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 uh, in um, El Salvador. So I'm excited about it. If we get past the biases and if the biases exist and continue to be bearers, then push harder. And I think that's what we're seeing young people do. Thank you, Mayor Hancock. And Dr. DePrince, I know you work very closely with students. Do you have any other advice or any other comments to make on this question? Absolutely. I would echo so much of uh, what Mayor Hancock said about the, uh, the uh, profound role that student leaders uh, play uh, and collaborators. Often we elevate uh, leaders in various forms, but there it, it takes a village, this kind of transformative change. And so what is, again, is, is in, in maybe building on uh, some of my previous comments, what's your role? What's your uh, passion? Um, there, uh, an organizer named Daniel Hunter talks about uh, there being room for each of us in social movements, that sometimes we think about the person who has the bullhorn as that, that that's our model of social change or our stereotype of social change. But it takes those of us who want to be doing direct service, who want to be working within systems to try to change them from the inside out. It takes a, a host of different temperaments and skills and and things. So to, to keep that in mind and finding who you are, um, how you're effective. Uh, to link that, Johnny, though, back to your point about the ways that youth who have been marginalized or minoritized for different um, aspects of their identities, how to overcome the barriers particular uh, to that. 
I certainly find myself thinking about some research on civic engagement that talks about the importance of your own identity and values. Um, that really, the more that you have a strong sense of your identity, identities, um, the more powerful that is for what uh, researchers would talk about as sort of communal civic engagement, this idea of, of collaborating together. And certainly my bias in terms of the opportunity to work with um, students at DU is that collaboration really is key to the kinds of big problems that the, the summit is going to tackle and that, that frankly all of our communities have to tackle. Um, this notion that there are very few problems that really are only local, they have this uh, interdependence uh, globally. And so I think the kinds of things that feed your sense of self, um, your passions and your skills and your values and your identities are so important to bring to bear uh, for that, the kind of collaboration we need. You know, I, if, if I might, I, I think Professor, you've, you've hit on something uh, that's very important. There's this famous, I'm, I'm a Chicagoan originally, and there's this, uh, this famous book about political organization uh, from the 1960s, Abner Mikva, who ended up with a very distinguished career in Congress and uh, on the bench, on the federal bench for many years. He was my congressman when I was a kid, but when he was a young graduate student, he wanted to get involved in local politics. So he goes into the ward committee's men's office and knocks on the door, this innocent University of Chicago grad student. And he says, hi, I'd like to get involved in what must have been, I don't know, the 1948, 1952 campaign. And they say, who sent you? And they said, oh, we don't see nobody that nobody sent, uh, which is a classic kind of Chicago way to talk about things. So, um, the then rather young Abner Mikva was a little nonplussed by this and realized that that was a waste of time. All he did was turn out to be a multiple, uh, you know, a, you know, a multiple term member of Congress, a, an advisor to presidents and a, uh, a, a federal judge with significant impact on the bench. Um, so what you were talking about, Professor, I think is is um, very much the case. Um, you know, who sent you is um, a kind of contemptuous sort of a, an attitude, uh, but you'll find it. And that question of, and, and there may be delays um, um, uh, in achieving your goal, but there are ways to build other alliances. You know, I always thought that you know, you mentioned, Your Honor, the, the March on Washington and, in passing. Well, in some ways, the roots of that were 15 years before when A. Philip Randolph and others went into the White House. And they kind of got, you know, yes, there are all sorts of injustices. And I think that Franklin Roosevelt, frankly, recognized most of them. But he was holding together a kind of a strange political coalition. He had a war to run, and he basically blew off Randolph. He said, yep, I get it. That's great. Now make me do it. How many people are you going to bring to the streets? 100,000? For various reasons, including Roosevelt's death, things were overtaken. Circumstances were overtaken. But in a lot of ways, I think that people like Randolph and the generation that came after him looked at that and said, what an excellent idea, Mr. President. I guess we'll do precisely that took them a long time and a new generation of people came up, but man, did they have an impact? You know, what is it? What would it have been 17 years later? Uh, a world transforming impact. Um, and so um, you've got to look at where sympathies lie, where alliances will exist. Um, where you can build uh, with in, within friendly audiences uh, and sympathetic audiences. And you will find them this way 
you'll also find them this way. You know, um, the mayor, I, I, it looks like she might not be able to come, but the mayor of the city of El Alto in Bolivia, which is called El Alto because it's actually above the city of La Paz, which is the highest in terms of altitude, the highest capital on the planet. Uh, I, I think I told you, Your Honor, last year at one point, I told uh, Eva Copa, her name is her name. I said, oh, we're going to be meeting in the Mile High City. And she said, Mile? I said, yeah, it's about 1.6 kilometers, something like that. And she's like, ah, we're twice as high as that. We're more than twice as high as that. And uh, all respect. But uh, I live at sea level, you know, so what can I say? But um, uh, she's, I think now she's 33 years old, 34 years old, and she's been in politics for over a decade. Um, and she found her way into politics in a period of political and social change in her country by making direct appeals to people who knew they were excluded because she's not only exceptionally young, but she came from a social class and an ethnic uh, indigenous background in a country where that represents the majority of citizens who had been pushed to the margins of politics for generations. When the moment arose, um, to be honest, it, it didn't really matter what the old guard thought. And they did this um, at the ballot box. I mean, there's a, you know, I'm not gonna get into, you know, a, 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 an entire three credit course on, on Bolivian politics, but <laughs> we, can go, we could be here a long time. But fundamentally they did this through the, through the ballot box. And uh, if she, you know, if you ever do meet her, she's a remarkable young politician with a lot of promise. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly, for that great comment. And speaking of Mayor Copa, um, our next question is for Mr. O'Reilly. What is the City Summit of the Americas? More specifically, what are the intended outcomes of the summit? Who will be in attendance, and how can youth get involved? Well, in addition to uh, Michael B. Hancock, the mayor of Denver, Colorado, we are going to have approximately 249 other elected mayors. We will also have a large number of uh, civil society uh, activists. We will have, as um, a, we mentioned, it was, I'm sorry, your name was Aragon, was it mentioned earlier? Um, we're going to have the youth forum. Uh, we will have a number of business uh, organizations because we're having something called the Innovation Plaza, which is trying to bring together businesses, uh, many of them from uh, the Mountain West, that um, provide solutions uh, or offer solutions to uh, city governments. Um, and um, so it's going to be a very broadly based. We also have a number of people from non-governmental organizations from around the hemisphere and around the United States that work on uh, urban challenges. Um, uh, and so, and many of them are folks who work on applied, um, you know, ap applied solutions to problems, kind of in the line that you have, uh, Professor. You know, they're not just here to be thinkocrats. Uh, they're here to be people who look to provide solutions. I feel I can say that my father was also a dean of a, of a university, a university for many years. Um, so um, this grows out of the Summit of the Americas process, which originated in 1994 at the initiative of President Bill Clinton. Uh, last year was the first time that we as the United States uh, hosted that event since the inaugural event in Miami. We met in Miami. Before it came around, we organized a whole round of consultations, both here domestically, uh, which included very explicit focus in, on, on youth priorities, and also with uh, internationally with non-governmental organizations and business communities, and then governments. Um, and we came up with an agenda 
that basically focused on pretty obvious in this um, period when many of you probably earned a number of your undergraduate and graduate credits like this on a screen on uh, public health and um, what we've learned out of this pandemic. It killed more people in this hemisphere than anywhere on earth and in a larger proportion our public health services did some extraordinary things, but on the initial response, that first three or four months, they failed. They failed all across the hemisphere in a way which was sometimes quite dramatic. And the knock-on economic and social effects of that initial failure have dogged us ever since. Uh, we focused on a digital transformation of societies. Uh, this might not be ideal. It might be better to do this in, in one room, but this works pretty well for, for you folks and for me. Uh, now, if you are in, and I'm going to cite it in spe specifically because I've spoken with um, local officials there. If you are in a provincial town 100 kilometers outside of Mendoza in Argentina, which is a pretty affluent country with, with relatively robust services, um, you can't do this. Those students can't probably participate in this uh, in a reliable way. So as we transform this economy of ours digitally, how do we make sure that we're doing so in a manner which is equitable, not just for education, but for doing business, for, um, uh, for doing government uh, when it becomes the norm? Um, how do we transform our economies uh, so that they're cleaner and more efficient, more effective? How do we transform our environments so that we're literally tending the garden so that they are greener and uh, more reliable? Now, the problem in Denver uh, and southwards to Denver, the, the pressing one might be water scarcity as it is all along the Cordillera, which starts in the Rockies and runs down through um, uh, through you know the the Andes in in the Americas, but it, uh, it but they're different as questions elsewhere, and we try to take these questions and there are a whole series of commitments. Uh, you can actually find this online. This is the the commitments document that uh, leaders developed, but we know that the perspective of a prime minister or a president will differ dramatically from uh, your perspective, Your Honor, or, you know, the perspective of, uh, you know, the mayor of Hoboken uh, and their challenges. They're going to look at these differently. So the basic thesis was, hey, why don't we take a look at these, these commitments that leaders made and then ask people who are activists, uh, folks from the private sector, uh, folks from local government, uh, and say, this is the table. Now, you tell us what we're missing, where the gaps are, where you think we should focus our attention, and where you intend to focus your attention. So in a sense, part of it, a slice of it, is advising national governments. But a large slice about it is deciding where folks are going to work uh, locally. And so we have, if you go through these commitments, we have all sorts of stuff about social equity and, and, and justice and inclusion that are intentionally throughout, identified throughout. But it's the mayor of Rio de Janeiro, who, uh, Eduardo Paes, who's going to come up uh, in Denver, and he's going to be talking about concrete measurable initiatives, commitments that city, local governance, governments can take in order to um, commit themselves to actually acting against racism in their communities. And, you know, Brazil's a multiracial, in some ways it's a more multiracial society than our own, um, uh, and challenge folks to sign up and commit themselves to be measured in that way, kind of in an analogous way that the C40 group of city governments 
um, have made those commitments on climate. That's the basic idea to, and I'm, I'm talking too long to, to prove, prove the point, but to set the table and let folks work in this area in ways that are creative and are valid for themselves and their communities. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly, for that great explanation. Mayor Hancock and Dr. DePrince, do you have anything else to add about maybe what you hope to see at the City Summit of the Americas, what you hope to, to see coming out of some of these transnational partnerships and uh, having youth come together and with all of these other different aspects of civil society, government, and such? One of the things I uh, would echo from Mr. O'Reilly's comments and the possibilities next week with the summit really are, um, I, I'm struck by the example you shared of um, places around the globe where tech access, um, access to things like broadband have an impact on people's ability to participate. And it's such an important global issue. And I'm struck by the opportunity next week for young people to really think about the manifestation of those issues locally. So for example, in some of my research, we work with um, uh, community partners to look at things such as um, crime victims and survivors, their ability to access the justice system. And we saw during COVID, um, a lot of jurisdictions trying to do creative things to enable people to access the justice system while we were all de dealing with different levels of public health orders and safety and so forth. And as jurisdictions pivoted to remote kinds of options, we saw in some of our monitoring an increase in um, advocates and providers telling us that victims and survivors were having trouble getting access to those systems because of technology barriers. And so many that there are a different set of technology and infrastructure issues across many of these problems that you'll be dealing with next next week at the summit. And I think there's much that can really seed our creative problem solving because there are local manifestations of these issues um, that that we need student expertise and, and perspectives on. Um, so I would just wanted to. Uh, echo that from Mr. O'Reilly's comments that these, uh, again, that there are some regional and uh, city specific issues, but I think there's probably more that, that binds us in terms of some of the challenges we face as communities. Um, thanks, Mayor Hay. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, everything that uh, the professor just said, you know, I was at the uh, Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles, and I think the State Department did a great job of bringing the mayors together to have conversations and one of the things that amazed me the most was when we sat down and started talking about issues that we were all facing as mayors of our cities and trying to serve how similar all the issues were, um, whether it was uh, youth and youth development and youth violence uh, issues, gang violence issues, uh, sustainability issues, economic parity issues, um, you know, uh, homelessness um, you know, the for housing, housing affordability, all these issues came up and, and how we, you know, each of us are trying to address them. Now, we're all in different positions. The local government in Denver, uh, heck, it's different from local government in, in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, now, imagine me trying to have a conversation about a mayor with a mayor in Bolivia uh, about uh, how we approach it differently and how our governing structures uh, work and operate and allow us the ability to address those issues. But nonetheless, being a mayor is still being a mayor. And, and you don't take home the burdens of your city any differently uh, if you're in uh, El Salvador than if you are in Denver, Colorado. And so we talked about how we wanna address these issues. And we talked about you know, the resources that are available for us to address them um, and, or not, you know, and, and, and how you know, different innovative ideas to address issues around sustainability, for example, um, and rather how much of a priority it is in your city. Because if you're simply just trying to survive with clean water um, or simply trying to survive with just food, uh, it might, your sense of urgency around air quality might be different uh, than you know, a city that has a lot of the resources and it's just a matter of how we equitably distribute those resources. So it's a great uh, opportunity for us to discuss, to learn from each other, innovative approaches. And I'm really looking forward to seeing a lot of these mayors again. 
uh, become friends for, you know, with the mayor of uh, Bogota, for example, Claudia Lopez, who I think is just one of the most phenomenal people you'll ever meet. And I think Denver's going to be blown away by her, uh, her energy, her, uh, her creativity, uh, her power, her focus, her intelligence. Um, it's just going to ooze through the room when she's present. Uh, and other mayors out of Colombia, for example, and of course, the mayor of uh, Mexico City, I'm excited, is going to be here. So uh, th this is, this is going to be a great summit. And I think uh, all of us are going to walk away better than when we walked in uh, because of our interaction with each other and the power of ch exchanging ideas. Yes, absolutely. I love that. The the power of exchanging ideas. Yeah. So the next question is to Mayor Hancock. Uh, Mayor Hancock, why is the incorporation of young voices in local government important? What can young people bring to support local and national government projects or spaces? And finally, how can municipal policymakers create sustainable mechanisms that seek out these young voices and perspectives that we've been talking about? Well, I think there's the power of want to, right? Um, I had last summer a conversation with a young man uh, from Venezuela. And as we spent some time around each other and had an opportunity to sit down and have dinner uh, with a group of people, he and I just happened to be at the end of the table together. Um, he talked about me, about his desire to return to Venezuela and to serve his people and to help his people is really what he said. Um, he recognized that there is a challenge with governing and governance of Venezuela. And he wanted to go home and to serve his people. And I said, well, what does that look like? He says, I want to be president of Venezuela. I want to change uh, our government. I want to change how people feel about their country. My people feel about their country, feel like they, so they no longer feel like they got to leave Venezuela. And he says, would you help me in thinking through that? And, and what I said to him, I says, you already have the most powerful tool anyone can have who wants to serve, and that is the desire. And, and I said to you, does your stomach get nervous when you think about the desire to serve your people? And he says, absolutely. And I said, that's what I call the bubble guts. <laughs> and when you have the bubble guts about an issue you really care about, um, then the only thing that is remaining is for you to get up and do it. And now, Use that power, that nervous energy, and go serve your people. Go home and figure out how you do that. And uh, he now we, we write each other, and he's he's headed home. Um, and and this is the this is the you know when you answer the question what the barriers are. Unfortunately, we all many people have a lot of ideas. They just don't have the bubble guts <laughs> to say I gotta go. I gotta go do this. And that's that sense of urgency, that sense of want to, that sense of I just there's I'm suffocated by the desire to go do this thing. And, and that's what I think young people bring to that, this energy level, that, that sense of something new, the sense of wanting to change and get things right. Uh, I see it in my own biological children, my nieces and nephews. Uh, I, I love that energy. Now, get up and do it and seek out wisdom to help guide you in that process. And I think that's, that's ultimately, no matter where you are in this world or in this hemisphere, um, I think it's the same. It's all the same. And I think that if we wanna see greater levels of democracy and diplomacy uh, in our hemisphere, young people are gonna lead us um, because they have the energy and they have the want to that I think necessary to make it happen. Absolutely. And Mr. O'Reilly, Dr. DePrince, do you have anything you'd like to add? Maybe about some opportunities for youth to get involved in their local communities? And let me just say, I recognize that bubble gut's not an academic term. <laughs> I'm looking. I'm looking for a footnote, Your Honor. One of the ways we talk about getting involved um, here at DU has really been championed by our Center for Community Engagement to advance scholarship and learning. We fondly call it CECL, um, and at CECL they talk about the iterative nature of of working towards change, and there being broadly speaking, four steps to think about that you need to think, connect, act, and reflect. And I think what that speaks to for me is the idea that 
it's it, that think part is is partly back to your self interest, uh, but it's also doing your homework, um, understanding how the issues that you care about are tangled up with root causes, so that we're not all putting band aids on things rather than really getting to the the heart of the root of um, interconnected problems. And so we each have our own work to do to to come to problem solving with the kind of requisite knowledge um, to share with one another and and um, start building towards solutions. But that's not enough in isolation. The problems we're talking about are, are global, they're interdependent. So how do you connect? So that, that theme of collaboration that I've come back to, who do you build networks with and who are allies, who are champions? How do you, who gets to, who can persuade who? There are some audiences where I can be persuasive and there's some audiences where a student is going to be much more persuasive than I. How do we strategically use that, um, use that access, not as a detriment for where a door is closed, not thinking of it necessarily that way, but how do we each persuade? And then you got to do something. I think Mayor Hancock's speaking to that, the, the bubble gut, and how do you, what, how do you get to action? Um, but action isn't the end. It's then about reflecting what worked, what did we learn, what did we learn about our strategies, and how do you go back to the beginning and take that understanding, your reflection on the action, to, to start over to that think, connect, act, reflect. Who do we invite in this time? What worked, what didn't? And so I think with students, whatever the frame is for you, that works for lots of uh, the work that we do here at DU, that sort of frame, but whatever the frame is that gets you thinking about interconnections and creativity and connecting with others, um, I just think that's an essential piece of, uh, of how students can be um, really effective and uh, just as I said from the start, you are absolutely essential. You are needed. We need your ideas, your creativity, um, your passion, your, your smartness, all of these things. So thanks, Mr. O'Reilly. Yeah. Um, you might not recognize it, but you're already many steps ahead. You're going to be graduating soon from a highly respected institution, which will have formed you in uh, productive ways. Uh, I have a Jesuit education, like the folks at Regis. I went out, but I went to school in Chicago, and one of the slogans they would put up on the wall is sort of this, Professor. It would, it was, you know, go out and set the world on fire, pull people up. You're already in a position to pull people up with you. You know, my parents grew up in the depression, uh, one in an orphanage, another in a very, very straightened circumstances. People pulled them up. I grew up in a nice, in a nice neighborhood, right? I had the comforts that that they could provide, a nice stable middle class background. You know, um, uh, I hope you don't mind, Your Honor, condolences on the loss of your mother recently. I was reading about her. An admirable woman. She never gave up. She always invested in her community, as best I can tell. She always get, she's committed to the neighborhood. She pulled people up, including your mayor. Um, you, you're already in a position to start doing that. Um, and it's important. Um, because people did that, uh, my parents dedicated themselves to their scope of public service uh, and education. And uh, my dad, and here's a pitch for what I do for a living before we get off. My dad was in the very first class of Fulbrighters who went to Italy. Uh, and uh, went to school there and did research in Milan with one of the universities out there. Um, that was in the 1940s. When the Berlin Wall fell and he was near the end of his career, he made sure his university invested in his line of work, which is close to your own professor and social, uh, social work, and um, helped make sure that Lithuania could reestablish its first 
um, School of Social Work in the 1990s after the fall of the Soviet Union um, is a sense of debt. Now, on the 27th, um, Corbell and Metro State are going to organize an event with the US Peace Corps talking a bit about public service and uh, exchange opportunities and the like. Take an interest in it. Stick your, stick your head in the door if you have time. Um, because there might be some opportunities that interest you or that you'll pass along to somebody else who may find it interesting. I have done this because my I've spent 30 some odd years. I was in my 20th when I joined the, the Foreign Service. It's been great. I have a terribly short attention span. I've got to work on police training programs. I've got to work. I've had the opportunity to work on setting up new extradition regimes for, for in countries where we have lots of interchange in migration communities and make sure that you're keeping communities safe, frankly, in both countries. I've got to work on economic development questions. I've got to organize two summits in less than 10 months, which seems like a, there are days it seems like a punishment, but it's actually really cool. Um, uh, and I've gotten to work on three continents and a whole range, actually four continents and a whole range of, um, whole range of different challenges and opportunities. It's great if you have a short attention span. But more importantly, um, that all sounds like cops and robbers. I mentioned in passing this extradition challenge. But really what it was is that at the end of it, you got to talk to people who'd given up hope that there'd ever be any sense of justice when their mother or their brother or their son was murdered. And it is a criminal justice challenge, but you managed to figure out how to unlock the key, you know, how to un take the key and unlock the lock that allowed these different institutions to talk to one another and do justice, uh, participate in, support that process. And there are 50 other ways that you can engage in that. Uh, it's a pretty good feeling when you get to do it right. Uh, so it's not just that I have a distractible personality. Um, and I suspect it's not just because uh, uh, I've seen the mayor operate now in a number of different things. I'm going to say that I'm going to stipulate, sir, that you like people. And uh, but it's not just that it's a chance to leave something behind and be, as I was reading somewhere recently, good ancestors for the people who come after us. And if you can do that, man, you've been useful. Absolutely. And we are approaching time, unfortunately, but I do want to invite our panelists to share any concluding remarks or any concluding thoughts that you have. Um, let's try to keep it to 30 seconds, um, just so that we can end as close to on time as possible. Uh, Mayor Hancock, would you like to begin? Let me just simply say thank you. I have a tremendous respect for Corbell and the work that you do and the important uh, space that you're in in terms of bringing the global issues and opportunities to uh, Denver, University of Denver, and to all of us in Colorado, and I've met some phenomenal people that I would have never met. Uh, Madeline Albright, uh, Secretary Rice, I, I would have never met uh, many of these folks had it not been for the Corbell School. So thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. And I'm looking forward to some of the cities. It's going to be an absolutely phenomenal, impactful event in the life of uh, Denver and the Western Hemisphere. Thank you, Mary Hancock. We're definitely looking forward to it as well. Uh, Mr. O'Reilly, would you like to share any concluding thoughts? Thank you, Mayor Hancock and the city of Denver for being crazy enough to help us invent this and to take the lead on so many aspects of this. Uh, I am confident we will have a great success and I owe, we all owe a great debt in that regard to the mayor, to the people, to the city of Denver and to the great state of Colorado. That is all. Thank you, Mr. O'Reilly. And Dr. DePrince, any final thoughts? 
Yes, so I would echo the gratitude and the great state of Colorado and great city of Denver pieces as well. And then I would say that um, to, to young people listening today, uh, you are essential. Show up, learn, contribute, speak, even if your voice shakes. Um, do your part to, to learn how to navigate uh, these, these spaces because we need you. You are, you are absolutely essential. And don't decide where it ends. I think some of the most exciting collaborations I've gotten to be part of were uh, in, they landed in very different places than we ever imagined um, at the start of things. So you may come to the table or a session around one issue. Don't decide where it ends. Be surprised uh, where that path takes you. But we need you and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. And thank you panelists for your comments, as well as to our audience this afternoon for your participation. Um, this has been a great discussion, very insightful, a lot of great things said. So we thank you all for attending the final event of our University Office Hours series. Uh, we encourage you to keep an eye on the hashtag City Summit on Twitter and LinkedIn to follow along as uh, different events and announcements will come about here in Denver, Colorado, surrounding the City Summit next week. Uh, as a quick reminder, the uh, video recordings of all of our university office hours discussions, including this one, will be available on the Corbell School's YouTube channel. Uh, links to watch, as well as additional information about the City Summit and side events that are open to the public will be available at citysummitoftheamericas.org. Thank you again for your attendance and have a great rest of your day.